Please welcome URJ Vice President for Strengthening Congregations, Amy Azen. One of my favorite cartoons addresses our comfort level with change. In the first pane, a person standing at the front of the room, like me, asks people sitting in chairs like you, who wants change? Every hand is raised. In the second pane, the person at the front asks, who wants to change? And not a single hand is raised. In the third frame, the person at the front asks, who wants to lead change? And the room empties out. Sound like a familiar feeling? I'm here to tell you this morning that we as a movement, as leaders of reform congregational life in North America, are going to have to want change, want to change, and all of us will need to lead change. You have been asking us how to get more members to join and be engaged and how to grow financial support. I'm here to tell you the same old ways won't work, but change can. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews and Jewish adjacent people out there who have not yet connected to Jewish community. Like us, they worry about their kids, their aging parents, their mortality, their jobs, polarization, instability, finances, and more. They yearn for safety and comfort and community and opportunities to make a difference. And they want joy and meaning and purpose. All of this they can find in our buildings and the richness of our Jewish texts. But their first instinct is not to seek answers at Torah study or to show up on Friday night. While it's true that we have something to offer the people who have yet to connect, there is a major disconnect between the ways in which we offer it and what they are looking for. And it's our job, if we want strong congregations, to work with them to find a new way. This requires all of us to change, and more importantly, it requires you to be leaders of change in your congregations. Let me share with you some trends that are driving this change. First, there are a lot more choices in our lives, and most of the newer ones are easy to access. Remember when there were only four TV channels? Remember when you had to go to a movie theater, or there was only the choice between Hulu and Netflix? The same variety exists in Jewish life. We can access Jewish content in so many different ways, and many that don't require us to get into a car. Second, the Jewish community is dramatically more diverse than we had thought. According to the Jews of Color Field Building Initiative, we have undercounted the population of Jews of color by almost one million people. One out of every seven to eight Jews is a person of color instead of the previously believed one out of 30 to 40. We also have a larger LGBTQIA population, and 70% of non-Orthodox marriages are between someone who identifies as a Jew and someone who doesn't, but is embracing being Jewish adjacent. Many of our congregations do not reflect this diversity because we haven't yet been open to change we need to make in order for people who do not look or act like us to feel at home. And we are marrying less and having fewer children, and having them later. If you are waiting for couples whose oldest child is in third grade to join so they can send kids to religious school, you are waiting even longer than in the past and encountering people who are much more settled in their lives. Even if they connect, they will not be as predisposed to make the congregation central as those at the same life stage did a generation ago. And finally, people who are part of our congregational community are living longer, so our congregations are aging, which is a good thing. These and other societal changes come together to create an interesting challenge. For the first time in human history, we potentially have five generations of active adults in our congregations at the same time. 
This wide age span can be a strength, but the challenge is that these generations want different things. In most of our congregations and our movement, most of the power, most of the financial resources are concentrated in the two oldest generations, who are more hetero, more in-married, more Ashkenazi and white, and wealthier than the youngest two. The youngest are eager for a Judaism that speaks to their experience of the world, delivered in new ways that work for them. The older generations often want to keep things the way they are, asking why the younger generations won't simply accept it that way. I want to introduce you to two people who, despite these trends, have managed to connect to congregational life. Please welcome Sarah Konishnik and Joey Noble. Sarah, your husband is from the former Soviet Union and connected to his Jewish identity, but not the religion itself. And you're Jewish adjacent, having grown up in a Christian household. Can you can, and, but you connected to Congregation Or Shalom in Vernon Hills, Illinois, through the March for Our Lives after the Parkland Massacre. But that connection wasn't random. How did you connect? So I actually connected with Or Shalom in Vernon Hills uh, several years before that. My husband and I have two sons. One is 18 and one is 14. Uh, we sent both of them to preschool, Jewish preschool through BJE at Congregation Or Shalom. It was really important to me, not having been raised Jewish myself, uh, to expose my children to the stories and the songs and the kind of culture that I knew they wouldn't be uh, exposed to if I didn't make an extra effort. So we were incredibly happy with that experience. A few years later, when it was time to uh, begin uh, Hebrew school, uh, we didn't feel like it was the right time to make that commitment. Uh, and at that point, uh, I pretty much disconnected for a few years. During that time, I became, I switched careers and became a professional gun violence prevention advocate and community organizer. Oh, thank you. So my job is to organize the Illinois Gun Violence Prevention Coalition, which is 186 faith and community organizations from across the state of Illinois, including uh, many of the reform congregations that are represented here today, including Temple Sholem on the near north side of Chicago and Congregation Or Shalom. Uh, so we are uh, 186 member organizations working together to reduce every type of gun violence in every type of community. Uh, every t in this work, it's very emotional, and every time uh, there is a high-profile mass shooting, it, we take it pretty hard, those of us in this movement. Uh, Congregation Or Shalom, just after the Parkland Massacre, joined in the movement, the National March for Our Lives movement, and joined in our community protest against gun violence and our demands for common sense gun safety regulations. Uh, and they invited me to participate. Uh, on the day of the march, uh, it was a Shabbat, and before the service that day, uh, they invited me to come and help make posters. I saw many of the members of our movement there, many of my friends from the movement. The Shabbat service itself was absolutely inspiring and deeply comforting at a time when I really needed some spiritual support. Uh, everyone made me feel extremely comfortable, and I was just really delighted to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, to what really um, impresses me the most about uh, Congregation Or Shalom is the way they've taken their values and their commitment to social justice, and they've been able to turn that into prayer and then action. So although my husband and I aren't quite ready to join right now, um, there's just really a matter of time. <laughs> I work a lot of weekends, so does my husband. Uh, but when we do join, it will certainly be Congregation Or Shalom in Vernon Hills. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Joey, uh, you connected through a more typical path, religious school and your bar mitzvah, but your bar mitzvah was not so typical. You were pretty resistant in thinking of giving up on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't a lot of meaning in it for you. And you were starting to get really excited about music. Then one day, when almost all seemed lost, you found a way. You found a way to combine um, your passion with your obligation. So can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, like you said, uh, I was struggling with my bar mitzvah prep, and 
I was to meet with the cancer at my temple, David Goldstein at NSCI, and we were in his office one day and going over what we can do. Uh, he was asking me what I was interested in. I s pointed at his guitar in his office <laughs> and <laughs> I said I was interested in playing guitar, interested in music. So we turned my bar mitzvah prep into music and song and that made it easier for me and more exciting. Uh, and it really was inspirational. I g also got to play in the service in the morning for my bar mitzvah. So that was very cool. Amazing. And you're still playing yeah. at North Shore even though you're in college. Yeah, I still try to make it down there on Friday nights for Shabbat services when I can. Uh, I usually commute. And there are other people like me uh, in the Friday night services who don't, you may not normally see at regular services, but connect like how I do through music. Amazing. Yeah. And I hear that you have something to play for us. Yeah. So as I return to the podium, you can get started. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Sarah and Joey. Thank you. <laughs> wow, imagine if a moment like that had been lost because of bar mitzvah requirements. Despite the trends Sarah and Joey have connected, let's examine how. Many congregational leaders are responding to today's challenges by trying to change. They differ in the amount and type of change. Some congregations will respond to the challenges of today by trying to improve. Improver congregations keep the same goals and assumptions and work to change their methods. They like things the way they are, but wish more people would attend and pay. They're willing to tweak around the edges, even making some changes that feel big to them, but actually don't seek to achieve much different except trying to get more people to do the same thing. They don't want to upset the power base of existing members. The words people are complaining or people are saying are mentioned a lot and given a lot of weight. Because of this resistance to change, an improver congregation rarely stops a program. This keeps them from freeing up resources to do new things. A lot of the conversations in this congregation focus on budget at the expense of mission, adherence to policy over risk taking, both of which make bigger change harder to achieve. Improving is important. Raising the bar towards excellence in how we e execute shouldn't be taken lightly, but it is not enough to thrive or maybe even survive going forward. If you are a leader in an improver congregation, you need to ask your leadership partners to step up and consider moving to the next stop along the change continuum to be a transformer congregation. Both of the congregations that Sarah and Joey are connected to are congregations experimenting with transformation. Transformer congregations shift assumptions and change goals to make deeper change than improver congregations. 
these congregations see the challenge not as filling seats in their existing program, but helping more people use the tools of Reformed Judaism to live lives of wholeness, justice, and compassion. Transformer consider people who aren't quite in the door in their decision making and are willing to stop doing some things, even if it means that they have to spend time helping people adjust to transition and loss. And they collaborate a lot more, not expecting the answers to their challenges are only found within the bounds of their organization. Ultimately, they spend more time speaking about mission and experimentation than budget. Some of you have already done experiments like the ones that Sarah and Joey's congregations have done. If we're going to thrive as a movement and as individual communities, the vast majority of our congregations need to be experimenting more, becoming transformers in more areas of congregational life, and you need to be willing to lead this change. What what do leaders in transforming congregations do? First, they start with the lives of participants rather than the needs of the institution or the program that they are trying to fill. Needs like a yearning to make the world a better place or a passion for music. As Rabbi Ari Margolis from Or Shalom said, we ask, how does being part of this congregation make someone's life better? If we don't have an answer to that question, we shouldn't be doing it. Leaders of transformation empower people who are ready to deliver, rather than only thinking of the leaders who are in positions of power. In Sarah's case, teens in the congregation organized to make the march and service happen, not the worship committee that may have felt the need to approve a change in Shabbat observance, although they were consulted, not the social justice committee that didn't have the march in their plans, although they may have supported the idea, not even the clergy who were willing to make room for others to have a voice and then work with them to turn their passion into action. Transformational leaders are willing to take a risk to serve people outside of the mainstream, to build for people not comfortable with the current system. Joey had not bought into the bar mitzvah process, but is still engaged as a college student. In Sarah's case, the leadership worked in relationship with congregants who opposed participation in the march and attracted people who normally didn't participate, members and non-members alike. By taking these risks and making these changes, both congregations sought to build for the congregation of the future, which helped to strengthen the congregation of today. An area where we have seen a lot of transform transformation and could support more is children's education. Many of our educators and their sacred partners are challenging us to think beyond improvements such as rewriting curriculum towards transformational change that rewrites goals. For example, moving from a schooling model that prizes knowledge acquisition to learning based in, on authentic Jewish experience or even learning that starts with children's or families' passions or big questions about life. There are some, we need you to step up to be leaders of transformational change. There are some congregations that will take on even more. They will seek to disrupt. Disruptor congregations change methods and goals and they are willing to put their assets to risk. It's really hard to disrupt yourself because it requires a willingness to change things even though they seem to be working. Disruptors completely refine their delivery model, maybe selling their building, restructuring their staff, or cutting out large portions of their program in favor of others. They may risk their current core audience in order to attract a larger audience that is on the outside. A disruptor seeks to create great Jewish experiences grounded in the needs of potential participants rather than thinking only about being the best at the standard programmatic areas of congregational life. And finally, they are laser focused on mission, often saying the words, we don't do that, but we do do this. 
Very few congregations will disrupt their entire congregation, but we need more of our congregations to begin disruptive experiments. And then we need them to share what they learn with the rest of the movement. Why talk so much about change? Because the decision to stay the same is a decision to allow the synagogue model to fade away. If you are an improver and do not go beyond improving, you are most likely going to disappear. Your endowments, planned giving, or advantaged area demographics might slow the pace of that collapse, but unfortunately, it will happen. Transformers have a very good chance of being strong going forward. You will also need endowments and planned giving because the funding model needs to change and demographics can help. The disruptors, we don't know. Risks are high. Reward might be as well. Total disruption will be rare. Disruptive experiments can take us to new places. And let me be clear. No type of change will be successful if it is attempted by a single person without buy-in and deep, sacred partnership among leaders, lay, clergy, and professional. My question to you is which congregation are you leading right now, and which do you want to become? If you are an improver, how can you start doing transformational experiments? If transformation is a habit in some parts of congregational life, how can you bring it to more? And if you are ready, where can you try something disruptive? We at the URJ are ready to support your congregation as you work to move up the change continuum. As an example, one of the most successful offerings we have for leaders of change is the Scheidt Seminar for Congregational Presidents and Presidents-Elect. I am thrilled to announce today that the Scheidt family has contributed an additional $1 million towards that program to help ensure that our congregational presidents are supported to lead through the change our congregations require. We also seek to leverage this network to work for change together, for you to share your experiments, successes, and failures, to collaborate among each other and with others in your communities. You will have chances throughout the rest of this biennial and after to learn more and to commit to being a change agent. Here are a few among many learning sessions that can help. So take a moment and look inside. What are you willing to commit to in this moment? Do you want change? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to lead the change? Together, we will meet the sacred call to bring Jewish wisdom to those who seek it. <laughs>